Yeah. Sure. Hi, this is Barbara. Uh, testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Alright. How you doing? Good. We got a packed house. Yeah, an FDR of more than Teddy. They're blowing up the place. Mike said, I haven't seen it this packed in ages. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ready? Good morning. <laughs> I get to go to the stage. Ready to roll, so I shall go to the podium. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Miller Center. Get warm. I hope you all are. Uh, our speaker today, David Wilner, tells me that he comes from Minnesota originally and his parents are Canadian, so this is balmy. <laughs> this, he's, he's glad to come south and get into the balmy 20s uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I, I told him in the green room ahead of time, first of all, I should tell you, I've, if you don't know, I'm Barbara Perry and I direct presidential studies here at the Miller Center. I'm also the co-chair with Russell Riley of our presidential oral history program. Uh, so in terms of presidential studies, I was so pleased when David reached out to me last year to tell me about his new book on FDR and his last 100 days. And I will tell you the reason why I was so excited was that I was saying in the green room that while President Kennedy seems like someone who was in my life because my mother took me to see him when he campaigned in Louisville, Kentucky in 1960, um, Roosevelt seemed like a god to me because of how my parents spoke about him. Um, I can remember my dad saying that he saved his family. My dad's family lost their home uh, in the Depression. Right after the stock market crash, his dad didn't work steadily for six years, and they lived off my dad's paper route. Uh, and thank goodness for some social welfare that came along in the New Deal period. My aunt would say that her parents, my grandparents, would sit out on the front porch and talk about FDR and how great he was and saved the family. My mother would tell me about uh, learning of the president's death uh, in April of 1945 and that she was so sad the next day when she went to work she got in the carpool and her best friend, my mother was an FDR liberal democrat, her best friend was a Father Coughlin fan and I should tell you that woman became my godmother so it shows you in days gone by how people could get past their political differences and still be friends. My, Mother and, and my godmother were friends from first grade until my mother passed in her 80s. Um, but my mother couldn't understand how she was so sad and her friend was not. So this is how I learned about FDR. So I was saying to David then when I made my pilgrimage to FDR's uh, birthplace uh, at Hyde Park in 2010, I didn't realize what a, a pilgrimage it was going to be and how emotional it was. And I was so taken with the, the spot and the beauty of it and the beautiful home and where FDR was buried. And I, I got through the tour and the park service ranger kind of rounded a corner and said, and this is the bedroom where FDR was born. And I burst into tears, <laughs> just involuntarily. Well, this was a great embarrassment to my friends, of course, who were with me, like, security, Barbara's mascara is running. Uh, but it, it, I also have to say that I keep in my office this wonderful picture of FDR and his beloved Fala. 
I have to say, any man, any president who will sit in his car and talk to his Scotty is just in tops in my book. <laughs> so this inspires me always in my office. So we're just so thrilled to have um, David here today speaking about this wonderful book. My, my brother used to tease me, as older brothers do, when I published my first book. He said, will it have one of those testimonials on the back from someone famous who says, I couldn't put it down? And I will tell you, that applies to this book. I'll pick it up in the evening and think, I'll read for a few minutes before I go to sleep. And an hour later, I will still be dipping into it because I keep learning new things about FDR's last 100 days, both the policy side of it, which David will talk about today, but also the personal side, the very poignancy of noting that everything he's doing at that time, it's going to be the last. It's going to be the last time he was at Hyde Park, the last time he was in the White House, and then, of course, his final trip to Warm Springs. So David is the perfect person to talk about this. He's a senior fellow and resident historian of the Rose Roosevelt Institute, which is based at Hyde Park. Um, he's a professor currently at Marist College nearby there, and a senior fellow of the Center for Civic Engagement at Bard College. Uh, in addition to this book, his other books include Progressivism in America, Past, Present, and Future, FDR's World, War, Peace, and Legacies, and one that I am definitely going to get, and that is FDR, the Vatican, and the Roman Catholic Church in America. He, because of all of his expertise in these areas, is a very frequent media commentator on national uh, and international outlets. And also because of his expertise in this part of American history, he's called upon by many European universities, uh, as well as those in, in England and Ireland, including Fulbright's, to be chairs as a visiting professor there. Um, as I mentioned, he is from Minnesota originally. He did his BA. Uh, summa cum laude uh, in English literature and history uh, from the University of Minnesota, and he earned his PhD and MA in history from McGill University. So our uh, process today is David will do an overview, much as if those of you were here for my Edward Kennedy talk, do about 15, 20 minutes of uh, presentation using some PowerPoint slides to give you an overview of his book as an introduction. Then he and I will chat for about 40 minutes or so, and we always want to leave 15, 20 minutes for you all to engage with us and with our speaker uh, with your questions. And then there is a book signing to follow. So I encourage you uh, to pick up a, at least one copy of this book. Um, you will enjoy it, I know, as much as I did and learn as much as I did. So thank you all for being here. And with that, let us welcome David Wilner to the Miller Center. <laughs> well, you can all hear me all right? Thank you, Barbara. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm delighted uh, finally to make it to the Miller Center, as I was saying to Barbara earlier. Um, for 10 years, I was executive director of the Roosevelt Institute, and we are based at the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park. And I frequently made use of the online resources of the Miller Center in my work uh, in various capacities, and for many, many years wanted to come down here and, and visit. And uh, so I, I'm especially delighted to be here. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the uh, president of the organization, Dr. Antolis, uh, and the staff for all of their help in getting me here today, especially Christina lopez gotardi Chow, and Robert Terrence and Alfred Reeves for their help. Um, one of the things I like to remind people just quickly when I begin speaking about Roosevelt is that if I were the president, uh, none of you would be in the room. The Secret Service would come in first. They would bolt this podium to the floor. They would wheel me in as President Roosevelt, and I would be wheeled up and pull myself up to the podium and lock my braces into place. And, and you look at Roosevelt speaking, you look at his left hand, it's always gripping the podium, and then I would be saying, my friends, <laughs> welcome to Charlottesville. <laughs> no. uh, so it's rather remarkable. We need to remember this was a man who couldn't get out of bed in the morning and yet uh, led the country through the Great Depression and the Second World War. And the other thing I, I would like to mention is that I dedicated this book to my father. Um, who was Canadian, but uh, remembered Roosevelt fondly, lived to be 102 years old and, and died shortly before I finished. In fact, he died roughly the moment I was finishing the book. He was aware of the book. Um, and my dad was a great joke teller, and he had one Roosevelt joke that I've never heard anyone ever speak of before. And it's a story of two uh, men meeting in the park one day. One of them is a brand new father. He's just had his first baby boy, and he's pushing the stroller through the park and he runs into his friend, and his friend says, oh, you have your new son, let, let, me, let me see. He looks down, and 
peeks at this young little tyke in the stroller and he says, what a handsome young, young lad. Um, and the father very proudly says, yes, isn't he wonderful? Who knows, someday he may grow up to be president. And his friend startled says, and what's wrong with Roosevelt? <laughs> All right, so as you all know, um, FDR is famous, of course, for his first 100 days. Uh, and this is a great slide depicting the, the first 100 days, dragging Congress along with him. Looks like new leadership is really going to lead, passing 15 major pieces of legislation in 100 days. Rather extraordinary record. Um, uh, he said in his first inaugural address, this nation is calling for action and action now, and action is what they got. Uh, and he call, also called on the American people to, to help him banish fear, uh, not to embrace fear, which is uh, another thing we should remember when thinking about FDR. Now, having lived in, and worked uh, at the Roosevelt Institute and worked around FDR in Hyde Park for many years, I often kind of admired his determination to carry on in office. And in a conversation with a friend of mine, another historian, suddenly came up with this idea to write a book about his last hundred days, this last period of his life after the election, um, when he had to struggle on uh, in ill health uh, to, to uh, try to complete all of his work. Um, I have to tell you, you do learn things when you write books. Um, I was a little worried about it. The book starts at Christmas time, and if you add, you know, if you count 100 days forward from Christmas, um, you don't reach April 12th. But then I you know, remembered to do a little more research and I remembered that the 100 days actually refers not to the presidency, but to the first 100 days of Congress. The, the first 100 days of, of Congress, the Congress was in term. Um, and if you count forward from January 3rd, when Congress uh, first met in 1945, literally within one hour, uh, 100 days to, to the, almost to the minute, uh, the gavel came down opening the uh, 73rd Congress on, on the June 3rd, 1945. Roosevelt dropped dead. So the, act the, the title is actually quite accurate. Um, so I'm, I always want to uh, mention that. All right, so today what we want to talk about is kind of give this quick overview. And what I like to say is that Roosevelt's trying to set the world on the path to peace. I'd say he had three major objectives in this period of his life. The first was establishing the United Nation or the institutional structures um, uh, of peace. Second was bringing an end to American isolationism. Um, and the third, the maintenance of great power cooperation, which above all else meant continued engagement uh, with uh, the USSR, with Russia. Now, in order to launch this effort, he began actually quite early on. We can think of the January 6, 1941 articulation of the Four Freedoms of really as the beginning of this effort, even before the United States was in the war. And what makes the Four Freedoms interesting and unique is uh, that, you know, if we think about it, freedom of worship and, and freedom of speech and expression, these are ideas that Americans are used to. They're written into our Constitution. But Roosevelt added freedom from want and freedom from fear. Um, he really expanded this idea of, of what it means to articulate these values. And really what he's trying to do here, especially freedom from want, he's linking this idea that American security and well-being uh, at home is linked to the security and well-being of people in other parts of the world. He would go on to continue to articulate this eight months later in the Atlantic Charter, which includes this provision of securing for all improved labor standards, economic advancement, and social security. Uh, you get a, a more detailed explanation of what he means by freedom from want. The United Nations is also mentioned, the eighth clause includes the, the, the need to establish an international security organization after the war. So this is widely viewed as the first moment where uh, the UN is, is uh, first conceived. And then of course, shortly after the, the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, Winston Churchill would come to the White House with great fanfare, if we have time, some, I might tell you the great bathroom story, uh, but we don't have time right now, so maybe we'll <laughs> save that for the question and answer period. And while at the White House, uh, the two men wanted to draw up a kind of declaration. Now, this is very interesting. Um, you know, the United States was now in the war, but there were many countries who were, in a sense, willing to try to help with the war, but maybe not ready to declare war. 
on Germany and Japan. So Roosevelt came up with this idea that they should draft what he called a declaration by United Nations. And uh, he invited all of the ambassadors from various countries around the world to the White House to sign this declaration um, uh, on January 1st, 1942. So this is an early draft. This is a document from the FDR library. And you know, uh, it's on White House stationery. And Churchill had brought this into the, to a meeting with FDR. And uh, as you can well imagine, uh, this question of signatories and who was going to sign this and how it was going to be laid out. And so, of course, they put the big four at the top, the United States of America, China, uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and then the United Kingdom. I don't know if the, whether this has a, has a light on it, but as you can see here, um, Churchill had listed the dominions underneath, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. And then the rest of the countries of the world are down here in alphabetical order. And Roosevelt, of course, said this is ridiculous, took out his pencil and said, no bloody way. And he said, no, these have to come down here and be in alphabetical <laughs> order. Um, and I think this is probably the best example we can think of as, of Roosevelt's antipathy towards British imperialism and colonialism. Um, fast forward a few years, and this is hard to see, but this is Roosevelt's sketch of the United Nations that he handed to Stalin and Churchill at the Tehran conference in December 43. It's very interesting. Here on the left, you have the 40, uh, the General Assembly, he said the 40 nations that were involved at the time. And very interestingly, underneath the ILO, International Labor Organization, Health, Agriculture, and Food. And this, in a sense, represents the future General Assembly, which of course includes the World Health Organization, um, uh, UNICEF, and so forth. And you have the executive offices of the UN, uh, the Secretary General's office, and then of course over here, the four policemen, which would uh, obviously include um, um, Britain, the United States, China, and the Soviet Union, which of course becomes the, um, the Security Council. And Roosevelt actually initialed this and signed it November 30th, 1943. Churchill's birthday, by the way. <laughs> All right, so big challenge now is how is he going to convince the American people to kind of embrace this idea that the United States needs to be more engaged with the world. And one of the big issues they have to overcome, as I said, is uh, isolationism. And so, as you know, Roosevelt is famous for articulating his ideas over the radio on a fireside chat. And in one of the most remarkable fireside chats of his career, probably second only to the banking uh, crisis chat, uh, in February of 1942, he got on the radio and actually had publicized in advance that the American people should go out and buy world maps. It was the largest sale of National Geographic maps, world maps in history. Uh, the, the New York Times and other magazines published various maps. Um, you know, there's no television at this time. And of course, he uh, gets on the radio and he says, now take out your <laughs> maps. <laughs> and uh, Roosevelt said, and I'm quoting here, that World War II was a new kind of war, uh, not only in its methods and weapons, but also in its geography. It is, he went on, warfare on every continent, every island, every sea, and most significantly, every air lane in the world. Now, of course, the typical way that the Uni Americans would view themselves at this time was with an equatorial map, which would see the United States as a continent safely uh, protected by two vast oceans. But if uh, we look at the world from this perspective, from a polar projection, you can see that the United States is actually not that far from the Eurasian continent. And Roosevelt had said, every island, every sea, and most significantly, he went on every air lane in the world. And of course, he also had published maps showing how close the United States would be to the rest of the world when you start thinking about flights over the poles. So this last point then, of course, is critical because what he's trying to make uh, clear here is that the security of the United States is linked to the security uh, of the people around the world. And this would, of course, include, as we said, freedom from want. Um, as far as the, the generation that fought World War II was concerned, uh, the war itself came out of the Great Depression. It was as a consequence of the world economic crisis, which was equally severe in Germany that we see the rise of fascist 
anti-democratic regimes in Europe and Asia. So the war has economic causes. So if we are closely linked to the rest of the world, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that Roosevelt would go on to say that, um, and again quoting him, this great struggle has taught us increasingly that freedom of person and security of property anywhere in the world depends upon the security and rights and obligations of liberty and justice everywhere in the world. And as I say in the book, viewed from this perspective, uh, America's struggle to defeat the Axis and other continents became synonymous with the struggle to defend American values uh, and ideas wherever the need may arise. The two, in short, were, were linked. Based on these concepts, FDR was able to argue that isolationism, or what we might think of as unilateralism, was not only naive, uh, but dangerous. And perhaps then it's not surprising that the symbol of the United Nations uh, is a polar projection map. All right, so we move on now uh, to this challenge, as I said, as he said in 1944, anyone who thinks that isolation is dead in this country is crazy. As soon as this war is over, it may come back stronger than ever. So he was very concerned about this problem of isolationism. And um, he said this in, in the White House to Robert Sherwood. And compounding this problem uh, at the end of 44, the beginning of his uh, final term in 45, were issues like the Soviet decision to recognize and set up the Lublin government. There were two Polish governments in existence in January 45, one based in London, which was supported by the Americans and the British, and now the Soviet uh, puppet government based in Lublin and Poland. Um, we add to that um, British imperialism again. Here you have what Churchill called, called his naughty document. He went to see Stalin in October of 1944. He's very worried about British uh, uh, presence in Eastern Mediterranean. And he said to Stalin, look, uh, when it comes to Romania, it can be 90% Russian, 10% British. But when it comes to Greece, which is what Churchill was really worried about, it's 90% British, 10% Russian. Yugoslavia, we can split 50-50. Hungary, you can split 50-50. Bul Bulgaria, 75% Russian, 25% British. So again, um, uh, you have this issue of British imperialism and Brit the British Empire uh, existing at the end of uh, 1944, beginning of 1945. And perhaps the most dramatic example of this, of course, is the British decision to intervene in Greece in December of 1944. They sent troops in to put down a communist uh, um, uh, upsurge of support, really, for the communist uh, involvement in the Greek government. Massive demonstration in Athens, 100,000 people, uh, British and Greek troops firing on the crowd, uh, 43 people killed. Uh, and these things were being written up in the American press. Uh, we tend to think about the tensions between uh, us and the Soviet Union at the end of the war as being this all-dominant factor. But if you read the newspapers in January of 1945, Soviet domination of Poland or potential domination of Poland is on par with, with uh, British intervention in Greece. They're mentioned constantly in the same articles. Uh, what kind of war are we fighting here? Um, and then there was this curious episode which happened in, in the same time when it was discovered that the Atlantic Charter was unsigned. And all of a sudden there was this discussion, well, are, you know, is the Atlantic Charter still valid? You know, and here's the Chicago Tribune saying the people have been fooled about the Atlantic Charter. Again, because of what was happening in Greece with the British and with the Soviet decision to set up their own government in Poland. So it's not surprising then. The, the 1945 State of the Union Address is not a particularly well-known document, but it's a fascinating thing to read because it's almost as if Roosevelt is warning the American people about what to expect at the Yalta Conference. Everybody knows he's going to go meet with Stalin and Churchill. They don't know where, of course, but it's uh, widely assumed there's going to be another meeting. And he warns the American people by saying, the nearer we come to avoiding vanquishing our enemies, the more we inevitably become conscious of the differences among the victors. Uh, you know, this is going to be, not going to be easy. This is a slide, by the way, of his inaugural. Um, but this is what the quote comes from his State of the Union. Of course, then he goes to Hyde Park to enjoy Christmas. Uh, but compounding, of course, uh, this situation and the chapter that opens the book is called An Uncertain New Year. Uh, 
um, is this massive German counteroffensive for the Ardennes crisis of December of 1944. Um, in the State of the Union address, quoting Marshall, uh, General Marshall said, we are about to enter the most critical phase of the war. The, the war is not over. Uh, it's clear that we're ultimately going to win, but it's not over by any means. All right, so then he makes this trip, this remarkable 14,000 mile trip back and forth to Yalta. Uh, we don't have time to get into all the details of Yalta. Here he is taking a one day break at, to the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, sitting with his daughter Anna and Churchill and Sarah Churchill, um, Winston's daughter. Uh, and then sailing, uh, flying overnight to Saki Airfield in the Crimea. And here's one of these rare color photographs of uh, Roosevelt. And you can see just how exhausted he looks. Uh, he's greeting here Harry Hopkins. The Russians have very uh, carefully and kindly put a, a nice carpet behind the, uh, the second seat of the Jeep. And they have put a kitchen chair here. You don't see it under his wrap. But again, this is to lift the president up. So he's at the same height as those visiting him. So when they want to review the troops, for example, his, his, his head level is the same as, as those walking along uh, beside him. All right, they would go to the Lavidia Palace where Roosevelt would uh, engage with the Yalta Conference. Again, we don't have time to get into all the details, but I think it's safe to say that there were three goals at Yalta. The final defeat of Germany, securing Russian participation in the war against Japan, and securing the establishment of the United Nations. You know, one of the things that I point out in the book is the importance of the German question in Yalta. Again, we keep thinking about Poland, we keep thinking about East versus West, the Cold War and so forth. Germany's not defeated yet. It's not defeated. We aren't even in Germany. We haven't even crossed the Rhine. And the Russians have gotten into East Prussia, but there's desperate fighting going on. Um, and so, you know, we forget that the critical issue to be discussed at Yalta initially was how are we going to orchestrate the final defeat of Germany? What are we going to do with Germany after the war? In other words, it's very important to remember that first of all, the war in Europe is not over. And second, that it was the fear of a resurgent Germany that stood at the heart of allied foreign policy. And then of course, we shouldn't forget the final defeat of Japan. Here's uh, Stalin and Roosevelt. Here they are in council. This is the disposition of German or of, of allied forces at the start of the Yalta conference. And as you can see, Germany really has yet to be invaded by the Americans and the British and the Canadians. And here, most Americans don't realize it. Four fifths, four fifths of the Japanese army in the second world war was in China, in China. And China, we had all but given up on as an ally. So when Roosevelt goes to Yalta, as Admiral Lee, he said, getting the Russians to declare a war against Japan was worth the whole trip as far as the US military was concerned. So we, we, we tend to, to overlook these things. All right, uh, uh, here they are in the courtyard, of course, the famous picture. Um, and moving on now, Roosevelt was insistent that he had to leave and he makes this rather extraordinary journey, what I call his last mission. Uh, to go to the Great Bitter Lake, which is part of the Suez Canal complex in Egypt, on his way home, so that he can meet Ibn Saud, of all things, to argue vehemently for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. He had been told time and time again by all of his advisors that this was impossible. The State Department was against it because we needed the oil and didn't want to upset the Arab states. Uh, the military was against it because they didn't want to see unrest in the Middle East. We, you know, uh, uh, Everyone he talked to said it was a bad idea, and everyone he talked to said it won't work, but he nevertheless insisted. Here's the king on the USS Murphy. Here's the king's uh, meal being slaughtered on the back of the ship. Uh, they had to bring sheep on board to, to uh, feed the king and his, and his entourage. Rather amazing experience for the uh, men who were on board the USS Murphy because they went down to Saudi Arabia to pick up the king and bring him to the Great Bitter Lake to meet Roosevelt. And here is a couple of the king's bodyguards. And here he is meeting uh, with Roosevelt on board the Quincy. Um, Roosevelt said that he wanted the king's help 
in trying to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. He brought out maps. He showed him that Palestine was a very small area compared to the rest of the region. And he said he felt particularly uh, um, concerned about the, the plight of the Jews uh, and wondered if the king could help him uh, rescue and rehabilitate the Jews of Central Europe, who I'm quoting him now, who had suffered indescribable horrors at the hands of the Nazis, eviction, destruction of their homes, torture, and mass murder. Uh, as everyone told him, the king would have nothing to do with this idea. Roosevelt pressed him three separate times uh, to the point where the king actually got kind of angry with him and uh, they broke off the discussion. Roosevelt, by the way, called it the great failure of his career. We can talk about that more later. All right, as you know, he comes home to address the Congress sitting down and then um, in this remarkable setting where he is wheeled down to the well of the house in his wheelchair in, in, in full view of the public and begins uh, by apologizing, in essence, as his wife said, and uh, it was this, as if he was admitting to the crowd, you see, I am a crippled man. It's a very moving moment. Then on to Warm Springs, Easter of April, 1945. And here he is uh, in Warm Springs in the little White House. Uh, working uh, in these final days. And it's probably fitting, of course, that what he was doing here was drawing up um, the remarks he was going to make for his Jefferson Day speech that was going to be broadcast on the radio on April 13th, 1945. The last person to see Franklin Roosevelt alive, or the last official, was Henry Morgenthau, who found him like this. Uh, the night, the evening before he died, working on this uh, speech uh, in this chair. And as you can see, he's got his legs braced up. And as I said, it's probably fitting to recall this here at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville because Roosevelt, of course, was a huge admirer of uh, Jefferson. And fitting that he was working on this on the day before he died on his radio address, his tribute to Jefferson. Taking note of the brotherly spirit of science, which Jefferson espoused, FDR observed that, quote, today we are faced with the preeminent fact that if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all kind, of all peoples, of all kinds, to live together and work together in the same world at peace. Knowing that millions of people the world over share to resolve, FDR remained confident that a lasting peace could be achieved, that it would be possible, again, to quote him, to move against what he called, quote, the terrible scourge of war, unquote. To all those who were ready to dedicate themselves to this purpose, he then wrote out in his frail hand the last words he would ever craft for the public. The only limit of our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Let us move forward with a strong and active faith. Unfortunately, FDR's unbounded optimism and faith in his own ability to carry, out, carry on, despite his utter exhaustion after years of toil, could not revive his feral body. His final tribute to Jefferson was never delivered. There would be no address from his wheelchair to the opening of the United Nations Conference, his chance to return to his beloved home upon the Hudson to live out his years in tranquility and peace denied. But his spirit and vision endure in the institutions he helped create, and in the determination of the people the world over to continue to build that, quote, permanent structure of peace that he worked so hard to establish during his time in office, and at no time more urgently than in his last 100 days. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David. So that gives you a flavor of the kinds of information and interesting analysis that you will find uh, in this book, The Last 100 Days, FDR at War and at Peace. Um, so with that, we'll uh, open up our conversation and then, uh, as I say, save enough time for you all to uh, be sure to develop your questions uh, for David that you might have. Um, There's so many rich areas uh, to go into here that it's hard to know where to begin, but uh, 
since you did mention uh, FDR's love for Thomas Jefferson, and here we sit at Mr. Jefferson's university, why don't we begin there? Um, we know that Franklin Roosevelt gives a very important speech here at the University of Virginia uh, for commencement mm -hmm. uh, in, was that 1940, I believe? That's right. 1940. Um, and reading last night in the book about his longtime friend and aide, General Pa Watson, uh, who had near Gordonsville, I understand, right. Right. Uh, his uh, estate, and, and in fact, FDR, I guess, came through there on his way back from Yalta, though P Watson had died right. on the ship of a heart attack. Uh, during the, uh, the journey back from Yalta. Um, what was it, and maybe you can even connect Jefferson to the, the Four Freedoms, and maybe we can delve a little bit into that, um, but what was it about Jefferson that so captured FDR's imagination to the point as well that it's, it is FDR, right, who dedicates the Jefferson Memorial right. in the midst of his own presidency? Well, there's many things, but I mean, I think, uh, it's interesting, you mentioned this earlier today and when we were talking before, um, this love of the land. Um, you know, he, 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 he deeply loved Monticello, Roosevelt. And I think for him, Hyde Park was kind of his version of Monticello. And another largely unknown fact about Roosevelt, and I have one of the chapters in the book, um, it's called The Architect, is that he actually fancied himself as an architect. And you know, when he came to Warm Springs to rehabilitate himself in the 1920s, uh, he designed many of the cottages in, in Warm Springs and worked with an architect whose name was uh, uh, Harry Toombs. And um, you know, really was a pioneer in designing uh, homes uh, designed for people with a disability. Um, and uh, when Roosevelt was anticipating retiring in 1940, um, he began to, he designed the FDR library. And, I'm, and you know, to the point where he put down twice in his career that he was an architect on his tax return, oh. um, <laughs> which the American Association of Architects was very upset about. He, <laughs> he designed the Bethesda Naval Hospital in, Wa in Washington. Um, and he designed this, uh, the FDR library, which included, by the way, two wings for Eleanor Roosevelt. And the FDR library still is the only presidential library that has an official wing dedicated to the first lady. Um, uh, and he designed his own retirement retreat called Top Cottage, which his mother was furious about. Uh, she made him promise that he would never sleep there as long as she was alive. So he never did sleep in Top Cottage. If you come to Hyde Park, you have to go up there. It's a beautiful hilltop, little, very simple building. And it, you can tell immediately, it's, it's completely designed for a man in a wheelchair. The windows are very low, there's no threshold and so forth. Um, so there was this sense of this sort of agrarian roots that I think that he shared with, uh, with Jefferson. Uh, and this kind of belief in, in this kind of um, strong tie between the land, uh, agrarian activity, and American democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and I edited another book called FDR and the Environment, which talks a lot about that shared belief. Um, and when you look at the CCC, you know, this idea that you take young men who are living in a city and take them out to the countryside so they can get their health back, right, as Roosevelt would say, and put on weight, uh, and work out, outdoors, that that was restorative not only of um, their financial well-being because they got paid and they had to send 25 out of $30 a month home to their families, by the way, they couldn't keep all the money, um, but also restorative to their spirit, this love of the outdoors. So there were many aspects of, of Jefferson that uh, I think that Roosevelt admired. And of course, that speech is very, very powerful. Um, I shouldn't do this, but just quickly, if I can, I can't remember everything in my book, <laughs> but, and I don't want to do him injustice, but he, he, he gives this commencement address just after Mussolini has attacked France in June of 1940, you know, stabbed France in the back. And, you know, he's reflecting on this, the, the deep roots of American democracy. So this is this, the commencement speech here at the university in he, 1940. And, and yeah, he's thinking about jo Jamestown and, and, and Monticello and Plymouth Rock and so forth and early American democracy. And he urges the American people um, to not to remain indifferent, quoting how, to the destruction of freedom in their ancestral lands across the sea. To do so was to, to hold to the now obvious delusion mm 
that we can safely permit the United States to become a lone island, a lone island in a world dominated by the philosophy of force. And then he goes on, imagine this, lodged in prison, handcuffed, hungry, and fed, fed through the bars from day to day by the contemptuous, unpitying masters of other continents. Those who still talk of isolation were fa fatally misguided, he said. The institutions of democracy cannot survive in the United States if the wider world was dominated by the gods of force and hate. A very powerful Indeed. speech Indeed. given right here uh, in June 1940. Right. Um, let's, let's delve into a little bit more the, the four freedoms. Okay. Um, you mentioned that, of course, he added to freedom of speech and, and worship. Um, how many of you watch at Christmas time the movie Holiday Inn? You know, the Bing Crosby film from probably made in 1941, I think came out in 1942. And do you remember the scene from uh, the 4th of July? Remember the Holiday Inn is Bing Crosby's retreat in Connecticut from show business and it only opens on holidays. So the segment that is that is 19, it's made in 1941, comes out in 1942. Roosevelt is presented in a video in that Bing Crosby movie on the 4th of July and Bing Crosby sings a song no doubt done by Irving Berlin written by Irving Berlin that's uh, dedicated to the four freedoms I will not attempt to sing it to you now <laughs> but Bing Crosby wears this very funny big tall Uncle Sam hat and talks about you know free from freedom of speech freedom of worship those are viewed as what are called by the political philosophers positive freedoms freedom of to do, to speak, to worship. That freedom from, freedom from want, freedom from fear, those are viewed as negative freedoms in that they're freedom from something. What causes him to add to that litany of free speech and free religion particularly, that is, that comes straight from Mr. Madison, 30 miles up the road right, here in Orange, right. uh, and our Bill of Rights, not to mention Mr. Jefferson's role in the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom along with Madison there. Um, but where does he add in, in what is a quite for our country a revolutionary yeah. focus on this negative freedom from want and fear? Where does that come from? Well, I think it comes in the main from this idea that, uh, you know, we are living in a modern industrial society. In spite of his deep admiration for the agrarian world that uh, that Rose, uh, excuse me that Jefferson occupied, and by the way, I forgot to mention that my point about bringing up Monticello is I think I'm right on this that FDR and Jefferson are the only two sitting presidents that b built homes that they designed themselves um, while in office, uh, which is what Top Cottage represents. But anyway, going back to your question. You know, it's very interesting. He, he goes back to that issue time and time again throughout the 30s um, in particular. We, have, we now live in a modern industrial society, uh, which is very exploitative of people, you know, the, the, the exploitative aspects of capitalism. And what Roosevelt is dedicated to, I think, more than anything else, is trying to make capitalism work for the average American. How do you do that? You know, Social Security, unemployment insurance, uh, regulation of the stock market, banking uh, insurance, and so forth. Um, and you know, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of long-term structural reform that he's engaged in. And time and time again, um, he articulates this idea that um, political independence is linked to economic independence, or political freedom is linked to economic freedom. And as long as we're living in a society where masses of people are living in abject poverty and are being exploited by this capitalist system, uh, we're not really f truly free. He said this very famously at the beginning of his uh, Economic Bill of Rights speech in January of 1944, where he spells out what those freedoms would be, you know, the right to an education, the right to health care, the right to leisure. I mean, what president would say that? Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the right to freer trade and, and commerce and so forth and so on. Um, but in, in, in articulating that idea, he says in the beginning of that speech, after all these years of war, he says, you know, we've come to the realization of the fact that necessitous men are not free men. People who are hungry and out of, the job, uh, out of a job are the stuff with which dictatorships are made. And of course, again, he's reflecting on this, the rise of these anti-democratic regimes that came out of the Great Depression. So, uh, for him, freedom from want and freedom from fear are, again, it's part of the cornerstones of how do you build a, a, a functioning democracy. So isn't this interesting that even though he wins by a landslide, 
uh, by two thirds of the popular vote when he runs the first time for reelection in 1936 that that means that one third of the people did not vote for him and many of those, as we have been led to believe, called him that man. They couldn't even say his name mm. because he was viewed as a socialist yeah. and a Marxist. And I just had a question from the media recently about a supposed coup, I think that's too strong a term, but that between the time he was elected in November of 1932, and remember he's the last president then to be inaugurated in March, so he was inaugurated in March rather than January before that change. Um, and in that interim period, um, there were some Wall Streeters, uh, some Wall Street fat cat capitalists who were trying to figure out how they could block him from being inaugurated. Um, so while people now may look back on him and, and, and I said sort of godlike feelings given how my family felt about him, that you had one third of, of the people who couldn't stand him and who viewed him as socialist and maybe even Marxist and a blight upon capitalism. And yet it seems that history has proved, and what you're saying is he knew at the time, he wasn't trying to get rid of capitalism. He was trying to make capitalism work for everyone, uh, work for those like himself who came from the landed gentry and those who had made their fortunes on Wall Street and elsewhere in industry, mm -hmm. but that it would not exploit uh, the proletariat, shall, we, shall yeah. we call it. Is that fair? Absolutely. In fact, I would argue that that you know, if you think about what's happening in the early 1930s with the rise of Nazism in Germany and fascism in Italy and militarism in Japan, that what Roosevelt actually did was save capitalism. I mean, if you, if you look at the provisions, he didn't socialize the banks, he didn't, you know, what he did was how do, you know, he tried to create a social and economic structure that allowed capitalism to flourish within the free market system. Um, so from my perspective, um, you know, if I were a Wall Streeter, I would sort of bless Franklin Roosevelt every morning I woke up. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you think about it, l look, look at the provisions. Some of this is in the first hundred days. I mean, you have the Emergency Banking Act and the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act, of course, separated commercial from investment banking because God bless the investors, let them run riot, but don't let them get their hands on mom and dad's mortgage or the local business, commercial banking and business activities. Keep those two things separate. He set up the Homeowners Loan Corporation in the first 100 days. They refinanced 20% of all the urban mortgages in the United States in 18 months. Um, we're talking about uh, 1,000 homes a day going underneath, uh, going under in, uh, in 1933 when Roosevelt took office. Um, they revolutionized the mortgage industry because they actually created the 30-year amortized mortgage in the process. And the mortgage industry looked at this and said, wow, this is a great idea, um, and adopted this. I mean, it's just an extraordinarily creative period in American history. Yes, there were excesses. Yes, there were mistakes. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to, to raise questions, you know, could they have done things differently? Were these, were these policies the right ones? I'm not an economist, um, but, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea that, that Roosevelt's economic policies can be criticized. But if you think of the state of the nation, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, watching the inaugural, she said it was frightening because people were so desperate, he could have said anything. And let's not forget, Walter Lippmann in the New York Times uh, called for a sort of mild dictatorship. Uh, the Herald Tribune on Inauguration Day, say, the headline said, for dictatorship if necessary. This is the world that we were living in. Uh, and Roosevelt rejected those ideas uh, and, and didn't embrace them. Um, and instead, you know, gave us as the slideshow, uh, this 15 rather extraordinary pieces of legislation. And let us never forget, um, he also said, I think it's a good time for a beer. And he passed the beer, the, the, <laughs> the food and drug, re re or the Beer and Wine Revenue Act to kind of advance the end of prohibition, which is why Franklin Roosevelt remains the sort of mascot of the American Beer Association. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also why my grandfathers really liked it <laughs> as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about one of the main themes of his last hundred days, but as you showed leading up to it, it had been a theme of his presidency, and that is his anti-isolationism, his fear of isolationism. And some of you may have been uh, in attendance uh, a year or so ago when the Miller Center, um, led by our scholars uh, Will Hitchcock and Mel Leffler, uh, two great foreign policy historians and Cold War historians, 
uh, but great historians of this period um, looked at the, the very topic of isolationism and the fact that FDR was right. It, it comes back periodically and it, it rears its, its head. Um, tell us about his fear, where that came from, and then on the other side of that coin, where does, he, where does his understanding of internationalism and multilateralism come from? Mm. How did he have a global view of the world? Where did that develop? Well, I think uh, Arthur Schlesinger uh, wrote, um, and I think he's right, that Roosevelt was very much influenced by two figures, Theodore Roosevelt, whom he enormously admired, his, his cousin Theodore, and of course, let's not forget that Franklin Roosevelt married Eleanor Roosevelt, so he married up. I mean, he married the niece of the President of the United <laughs> States while he was president. So he knew, you know, uh, let's not forget that. Um, and also Woodrow Wilson, he served in the Wilson administration as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So I, I think that those two, <coughs> two individuals had a great in, deal of influence on him, the sort of, uh, you might, sort of blusterous and somewhat bellicose attitude of Theodore Roosevelt on the one hand and the more idealistic <laughs> internationalism of Woodrow Wilson on the other. So, uh, you know, I think those two things together kind of uh, helped uh, mold FDR's internationalist thinking. But he was also deeply uh, influenced by Cordell Hull, another great Southern senator who would go on to become Secretary of State under Roosevelt, a man who was obsessed with um, freer trade um, and is largely responsible, I think, for, in many respects, the globalization of the world's economy that we, that we now uh, experience today. Hull was very much against uh, high tariffs, which he called the tax on the poor. In 1913, he started talking about, 13, he started talking about establishing a World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. He thought tariffs should be reduced so the poor wouldn't have to pay these high prices and there should be a progressive income tax that the wealthy should be paying more uh, for government revenue rather than uh, through, uh, through tariffs. And so he articulated these ideas when he became Secretary of State through what was called the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act. Uh, and Congress being very protective and somewhat parochial, uh, the whole idea was reciprocal. So if, we, if you're Costa Rica and you want to sell me coffee and I'm American, I want to sell you, I don't know, whiskey from, from <laughs> Kentucky. Kentucky. Um, uh, we cut a deal and we, lower, we agreed to lower the tariffs. Uh, the, the, the act actually gave the president the authority to raise or lower tariffs by 50% and gave that authority to the president. But it also set up this provision that once we shake, um, that bilateral agreement would apply to any nation that belonged to the most favored nation club. So you instantly multilateralize every bilateral agreement. And the, this is the forerunner for GATT. This would, in 1947, we would do the same thing except we'd all go to a nice place like Switzerland and do it all at once. <laughs> and we'd have the general agreement on tariff and trade, which I think served the world very well uh, until the early 1990s. I think we can talk about this later, and this is a more controversial thing perhaps to say, but, but um, under GATT, there still were, there were ways in which nations could sort of protect key industries. And in the early 1990s, we went to a kind of free market fundamentalism that I think took off all provisions. And you really had uh, a kind of globalization that was based on just pure capitalism, which I think has played a great role in the sort of um, destruction, if you will, of American manufacturing and manufacturing Western Europe. Most of the, 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 those types of jobs went to Asia uh, because you know, we, we gave up on the idea of, of keeping on some measure of protection. So sort of t taking that to it maybe an illogical yeah. extreme. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to describe a president. Tell me which president you think this is, folks. Um, he meets with um, a Russian adversary in private with no one else in the room. <laughs> he relies on his daughter to help him write speeches. And he's told by his advisors, don't meet with that foreign dignitary. And he meets with him anyway. Now, you know where I'm going with this, right? I just described FDR. Yep. So what I learned in reading this book, especially the fascinating chapters on Yalta, sorry, sorry. that's okay, is that at various times in the, the meetings at Yalta, FDR would go in in private and meet with Stalin. No one else there. I knew that daughter Anna had gone with him 
Much to Eleanor's upset, and we, I think we'll want to circle back and talk a little bit about the family dynamics at work there, but daughter Anna was not only there to look after her dad, but I discovered that she was helping in speech writing, contributing whole drafts, apparently, or at least working on drafts that the president's speech writer was giving him. And then you said on the meeting with uh, King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia that the FDR's advisors had said, don't do that. Don't, don't stop on your way back from Rialta and meet with him. Trump versus FDR. Um, talk about that. Discuss. Well, no, it's absolutely true. I'm, and uh, you, you're the first person. I mean, this has been in my head for the last, I don't know, so many months. Um, and I've decided, I haven't said anything to anybody. But yeah, I mean, my first, <laughs> my, uh, I do write an occasional column. And you know, one is tempted sometimes. And then sometimes you just say, no. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's absolutely true, although Charles Bolin was, the interpreter, was tasked with the idea of writing up notes. So he, he had a dual role. He was a note taker, which were immediately turned over to the staff at Yalta and transcribed. Uh, and that transcription was then circulated with Churchill and Stalin. Uh, there, uh, Stalin's interpreter did the same thing. So the in that respect, it, it was quite different. There was an immediate sharing. In terms of the one-on-one -on -one meeting with Ibn Saud, um, yeah, it's an extraordinary, I mean, even myself, when I read that chapter again, I'm, I'm really struck how everybody said, you know, for policy reasons, um, you know, with the oil and with the military dimension and, and so forth, and also the futility of talking to Ibn Saud about this question. I mean, the, the the, of establishing a homeland yeah, in Palestine and, and, for and Jewish refugees. That, that he would absolutely, utterly reject this, and this was going to jeopardize this kind of budding relationship with the Arab world and so forth and so on. Uh, and Roosevelt insisting that he had to go ahead. One of the most poignant stories about that segment in your book that I really loved that shows both the, the, the famous charm of FDR, but, but with true poignancy, that in discussing his somewhat limited mobility with the king. The king who was aging said, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the point where it's kind of hard for me to walk as well. And FDR said, oh, I have a twin for this wheelchair that I'm in, and I'd like to make a gift of that to you. I'll give you the, yeah. the additional wheelchair. Uh, they, they, uh, you know, he really, th that really did establish what the king regarded as his bond of friendship uh, with FDR. And that's, that's true among many countries in the world. Morocco, too. I mean. In Morocco at the Casablanca conference, again, this is French territory, right? Colonial, uh, essentially colonial to French territory. And the president of the United States wants to dine with the king of Morocco by himself. And of course, since Churchill wouldn't invite himself in. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you know, this whole idea, he met with King Farouk of Egypt. He met with Haile Selassie on the way home. Selassie, the first thing he did when he came to the United States for the first time, left the airport, went straight to Hyde Park and laid a uh, wreath on the grave of Franklin Roosevelt. You know, the status that he is conveying to these, you know, colonial, emerging colonial uh, lead leaders who are leaving colonialism behind uh, was extraordinary. On the question of Trump, I mean, I will say this. Uh, I do think the media is, is well, let's put it this way, very reckless. Um, we don't really have, uh, at least certainly the television media in the United States, it doesn't operate on a very sophisticated level. And um, I constantly think, you know, they keep going, they're, they're obsessed with this particular individual, Mr. Trump, and they, uh, you know, they keep bringing up things again and again. They speculate about this, they speculate about that. And I think it would be uh, good for us historians to remind people that other presidents have behaved this way and that, um, you know, frankly, this, this constant speculating about, uh, is a disservice. It's a disservice to the American people. But we have to wait in, in judgment and see what, what was actually discussed, what was going on, um, uh, before we rush to any kind of conclusions. So. Well, and this is exactly why the Miller Center exists and why Mr. Miller founded it in the 1960s and 1970s, we conceived of the idea and founded it in the 70s, that in another difficult time in American politics, so that we can talk about these things, put them into context. We're constantly being bombarded by media, but thank goodness they call us yeah. and they talk to our researchers and they talk to us. 
uh, about it, is this different, is this unprecedented, yeah. and you can draw those lines and you could say, well, ju I just read this book and I'm finding out that some of the things that the current president is doing are not unprecedented, but this is where it may depart from precedent and I think that's yeah. a really helpful service. Yeah. Before we get to your questions, let me put that now go circle back to the dynamics um, at Yalta. Um, could you talk a little bit about that relationship with uh, Churchill, uh, among Churchill, Stalin, FDR, uh, and then also the family dynamic of having Anna with him and FDR's decision explicitly not to take Eleanor, who, who really wanted to go, as I understand, it yeah. accompanying him. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's, um, I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, Frank, that Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt certainly loved each other, um, they had, but they had a political partnership. Uh, I would say that it wouldn't be that un unlike, say, the partnership between Bill and Hillary Clinton. You know, Roosevelt had a weekly breakfast meeting with Eleanor. Eleanor had a special box uh, on his bedside at night where she would leave him memos about issues that she wanted him to look into. Um, they really were political partners. Um, we don't know the extent to which Roosevelt had a physical relationship with Lucy Mercer, which does come up in the book uh, back in, um, um, at the time that he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, at the end of the 1919, 1920. But, but um, w you know, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that something was going on and that this really changed the, the nature of their relationship. Um, and so uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I think Roosevelt is kind of craving uh, 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 more solace in his life at this point. Um, he kind of craving uh, that he could get that from Eleanor, but you know, it's just not her, it's not her role in the world. Um, uh, and so he, he turns back to Lucy, does he, he not? He does turn back to Lucy and others, not just Lucy, but uh, you know, he spends a lot of time with uh, uh, Harry Hopkins, Mar Mackenzie King, um, Daisy Sookley is very important to him. Not as, you know, carrying on relationships or things like that, but just people who do not have an agenda. And Eleanor has an agenda most of the time. And so, uh, and Anna was very jealous of her brothers being able to go to these conferences and she wanted to go. And Churchill frequently took his daughters with him. So she brought this issue up. And so, uh, So there's you know, a great photo in the book of uh, Anna Roosevelt, uh, Sarah Churchill, and uh, Kathy Harriman, Her Herriman, yeah. Averill Harriman's daughter. So yeah. the three of these, youngish women, uh, yeah, they're there. seen yeah. to their fathers in, in this yeah. diplomatic conference. Anyway, she, she is there to protect him. She plays a very important role, I think, Anna. It, it, actually, through the entire last year of his life, uh, she's, she really takes on a very active role in that sense of trying to protect his, his energy. Um, and then with respect to Churchill and Stalin, of course, by this point, the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill has utterly changed. I mean, they had great affection for each other, great respect for each other. But um, world peace depends on the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, period. I mean, in a way, Churchill is sort of taken for granted. Um, he understands that he is a, a second, he's a junior partner in that trilateral relationship now. This really becomes clear by the time they get to the Tehran conference at the end of 1943. You know, we forget that the United States, like China today, the United States was an enormous economic power, the largest economy in the world in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. But we weren't the greatest military power. We didn't, ha you know, we, our Navy wasn't as large as the British Navy and so forth. They had the empire, they sort of had the status. And I think you can make an argument that it really isn't until roughly 1942, 1943 that the United States assumes that global role. Which is why, by the way, I find the visit to Ibn Saud so interesting. Because think about it, this was a British part of the world. And here's the United, President of the United States coming in, he's gonna talk to the King of, of Egypt, he's gonna talk to Haile Selassie, and he's gonna meet with Ibn Saud. Which, by the way, all this drove Churchill ballistic. <laughs> he you know, uh, what are you gonna do, who are you talking? And he absolutely insisted on meeting, he went to meet all three of them a week later. Um, <laughs> you know, what did the President say? Um, so it's, it's really interesting. So, um, and Stalin, of course, you know, Stalin is in a very strong position and we shouldn't forget, let's put it this way, if you combine all of the casualties, all of the deaths of the American soldiers in World War II with all of the deaths of the British soldiers in World War II, it doesn't exceed the total number of men killed, Russian soldiers killed in the Battle of Stalingrad alone. So, you know, they had lost 20 to 25 million dead. 
And as far as Stalin was concerned, he had paid with blood and treasure the right to, in a sense, sort of dictate what was going to happen on his borders. Um, and I make this point in the book, and, and you, you may not agree, but from the American perspective, and certainly from Roosevelt's perspective, I think he saw the Soviet Union as, as a challenge, and certainly Stalin is a brutal dictator. He understands all that. But the Soviet Union itself is largely a continental power that is worried about the security on its borders. And what the British Empire represents is this old world that Roosevelt thinks has to go away. Um, and we tend to think of the Yalta and that part, period of history as East versus West, you know, the Cold War dynamic. But I don't think Roosevelt saw it that way. It's the old world versus the new world, a new world that he's trying to create. And he needs the Soviet Union to collaborate in that, constructing that new world, or at least be, you know, willing to talk. Um, and so he's looking beyond, as, as I said in the book, he's looking beyond victory to, to how are we going to create this new world. And Churchill, in many ways, is more complicated than Stalin. Um, <laughs> because, you know, Stalin has his security needs on his borders, and we try to negotiate a reasonable understanding about what's going to happen in Poland and so forth. But, you know, there's one point in the book where Churchill says, or excuse me, that Roosevelt says to uh, Hopkins, again in January 1945, Churchill doesn't understand. He, he's trying to undermine our position in China. He doesn't understand that the people of Asia will not want to live under white supremacy. And that one day, the for in spite of civil wars and difficulty, he actually says this, one day China will be the major factor in the Far East. Um, Prescient, so, to yeah. be sure. Well, let's turn to you all. What questions do you have? And if you'll raise your hand and then wait for the microphone to come to you because we are streaming this live and, of course, we archive it for our website. So who has questions to offer? I, we have two here. Christina, thank you so much. We'll start here and then we'll go there. I wonder if you could comment on uh, how forceful uh, FDR was with Truman to leave the Senate and take the vice, presidency, uh, the, the, the vice presidency and the consequence of it? Uh, not at all, actually. I mean, Truman was on a list. Uh, um, it's a very interesting question. I mean, in the summer of 1944, well, let's go back, backtrack. In, in, in the summer of 1940, when Roosevelt decides to do the very controversial thing and run for a fourth, a third term, that's the year that he pays a lot of attention to his vice president. Um, you know, the, he's anticipating that the United States is going to get involved in the Second World War, and he's worried about the future of the New Deal. And the one man who is you know, one of the great champions of the philosophy behind the New Deal is Henry Wallace. And so that's the time that he thinks, and he actually says to James Farley, a man like me could drop dead at any moment. You know, so he's thinking about his vice president. Who's going to carry on the New Deal once I'm gone, once this war is over? Um, and he picks Wallace. In the summer of 1944, Wallace was not popular. You know, he's a liberal Republican from Iowa who switches parties finally at the end of 1930s to become a Democrat, so he becomes vice president. He wasn't very popular with the party boss, bosses of the Democratic Party. They thought he was too left-wing, too radical. In the summer of 1944, Roosevelt doesn't need a political fight. He's concerned about the Senate. Uh, he needs to get the United Nations Charter ratified by the Senate. He doesn't want to be seen as a left-wingy kind of Democrat. Um, and so when the party bosses approach him and say, we, you know, Douglas, Truman, I've forgotten the third, they, they hand him a basic list. He says, any of those three is fine. Uh, <laughs> they end up sort of with Truman. And he never endorses Truman. He, he says publicly, uh, he endorses um, Wallace, you know, as, as the potential running mate, but he doesn't do anything to support Wallace at the convention. And these guys kind of orchestrate uh, a means by which they can dump Wallace and bring Truman in, and Roosevelt accepts that decision. I'd like to uh, talk a little more about Truman and the relationship. One of the reasons I came today was I had recently read a book called The Accidental President. Yeah, great book. Great book, yes. And it's about the first 100 days of Truman. Uh, and a bookend or, or an opposite side from yours. And the main theme, or one of the themes, clearly was 
how ill-prepared Truman was uh, by Roosevelt. So talk a little bit about his sense of the end of his life and what you just said about I could drop dead, that yeah. kind of view toward him. And a second related to somebody you talked about. Are there any thoughtful good books about Anna Halstead or Anna Roosevelt? Um, because she plays a very important part, and at least to me, I don't see much about it. Yeah. Well, two things I'd say. First of all, uh, going back to Truman, um, he was ill-prepared. Um, I, I think it's important to remember that the role of the vice presidents, you know, was vastly different than it is today. It's only been in the last three or four administrations that you start seeing the, the, the vice president take on uh, a more significant role. Although, again, Wallace got serious responsibilities from Roosevelt during the war, um, office war, economic mobilization, so forth. But um, so the vice president's office is not one that, you know, that I'm, I would guess that many vice presidents were not really, quote unquote, prepared for anything uh, in, in our past history. Um, the other thing is Franklin Roosevelt is physically not present. I mean, he's constant. One of the points of the book is it's almost as if he's trying to escape Washington or escape the White House. <laughs> um, you know, the longest period he spends in the White House is the 16 days in the middle of March uh, from the time of his election until he dies. Right after the election, he goes off to Warm Springs for three weeks, then he comes home for a few days, and he goes off to um, Hyde Park for Christmas, then he comes home again, he's home for, uh, back in the White House for a little while, and then he's off to Yalta, six weeks in Yalta. Home, uh, a couple of days, Hyde Park, and back to Warm Springs again. So, um, so they're, they're just not physically in the same space. So that's another reason why I think Truman was essentially, you know, never got really got the opportunity to, to be uh, brought up to speed on some things. But then, you know, you, one has to wonder whether that would have happened even so, because the vice presidency was a very different uh, animal at that time. And just one point, to, uh, I, I'd certainly watched, for example, the PBS uh, series that Ken Burns did that David consulted as the historian for uh, the series on the entire Roosevelt family. Um, I watched again uh, the, the last episode to remind myself of, of many of the points that are in David's book in preparation for today. But one thing that I wanted you to know is that in reading the last chapters about FDR's final, final days, and I had read those stories, man, I'm, there's so much richness in David's book because more diaries have opened up, more papers, more collections have opened up, and because of his uh, expertise in and his experience at Hyde Park, he has delved into all of those. So you just get this richness of detail that makes you feel like you're sitting in that room with FDR in those final days down in Warm Springs. Other questions? Other hands? Yeah, Matt. Matt is a graduate student here in history and studying uh, foreign policy with Will Hitchcock. Great. Well, thanks so much. I, you mentioned um, that Woodrow Wilson was one of FDR's um, main role models, and, and of course the both were presidents at the end of these great world wars. And I was wondering what um, lessons or um, um, you know, how FDR drew on Wilson's example in a positive or a negative way in conducting these, uh, this end game of World War II? Well, you know, uh, in that last period in the White House, there's this extraordinary interview that he gives with Anne O'Hare McCormick from the New York Times. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just incredible. He literally talks about his entire four terms in office. He explains about the Russians. He says, you know, they're horrible, they're awful, but we had to use, he actually uses that phrase, we had to use the opportunity of the war to draw them into the international community. I mean, in a sense, the, the Germans had done us all a favor, you know, in a sense, by, by attacking Russia. So now we had this opportunity. Um, but he also said, and I'm paraphrasing, but roughly speaking, he said he dreamed of going down in the, in the world as a president who succeeded where Wilson had failed uh, in establishing a United Nations. And, um, you know, the other thing that's rather interesting, there's a, a wonderful diary written by Wilson Brown, who was a naval aide to Roosevelt, um, uh, who was with him in 1935. You know, Roosevelt liked, again, he loves to escape, right? So he gets on a naval battleship and goes off fishing in, uh, in the, in the <laughs> I've forgotten if it's the East Coast or the West Coast, I think it's the West Coast somewhere. And he's alone with Wilson, that's it. 
with Wilson Brown. Um, and it's the moment at which Haley Selassie, you know, which, in which uh, Italy invades Abyssinia in 1935. And, you know, Wilson Brown writes about the education of the president because he's getting all these telegrams about what to do and he's witnessing the ineffectiveness of the League of Nations. And, you know, you can see the mind churning about how would you make an international organization effective? And of course, the idea is you set up an executive body that can act, which is called the Security Council, you know? Um, so I think, uh, I think Wilson was really important. Uh, you know, Wilson embraces freer trade, Wilson embraces freedom of the seas, and Wilson embraces uh, self-determination and so forth and so on. But I think what Roosevelt tried to do was insert more power into that equation. I mean, he really understood that power was a reality and that Soviet power was a reality and that the only way that you're gonna maintain peace in the world was to, in a sense, get along with the Soviet Union. And by the way, to those of you who, you know, people like to think of Churchill as his great champion of the Cold War, when he got back from Yalta, he told a friend of his, you know, poor old Neville Chamberlain was wrong about Hitler, but I don't think I'm wrong about Stalin. And he said in the British Parliament, that he knew of no government in the world that was kept its word more honorably than the Soviet government. I mean, you know, something to that effect. <laughs> you know, so Churchill, they also, they both, it's a little bit like Reagan and Gorbachev and Margaret Thatcher. You know, this is a guy we can do business with. This put on blinders to everything else. And they also thought that Stalin was being advised by in council. There were two Stalins. There was the Stalin you met face to face, but then he'd go back and talk to his cronies and, and things would change, which they had actually completely wrong. But there was very little information. You know, we didn't know much about the Soviet Union, uh, neither did the British. So we didn't have these criminologists trying to figure out what the hell was going on inside the Kremlin. But anyway, so Wilson was, was, was very important. And I think, um, if I can quote here, um, I love this quote. This is also from that 1945 um, um, State of the Union. He says, you know, again, anticipating the difficulties that we're going to face, he says, in our disillusionment after the last war, he said, we preferred international anarchy to international cooperation which with, with nations that did not see and think exactly as we did. We gave up the hope of, it, of gradually achieving a better peace because we, couldn't, we had not the courage to fulfill our responsibilities in an admittedly imperfect world. We must not let that happen again or we shall follow the same tragic road again, the road to a third world war. So again, very pressing it, I think, you know, and looking at the example of Wilson and thinking how he could correct those mistakes. So we're coming to the end, and I just wanted to share with you the, the last paragraph of David's book, which he shared with me, because I think it ties it directly to our time today. Uh, David ends his book by saying, the world we live in today is certainly not perfect, right here. Uh, citing back to FDR. But as the American people retreat into xenophobia and nationalism and demonstrate less willingness to engage with other nations and peoples, we should reflect on the price that Franklin Roosevelt and so many hundreds of thousands of others paid to secure global peace. We should remember FDR's vision, faith, and idealism, his conviction that the world's problems are America's problems, and ask ourselves if, in the face of the challenges confronting us today, we will exhibit the same courage to live up to our international responsibilities. So with that, please give a warm thank you and <laughs> express your appreciation to David. If you'll let David make his way out to the ante room so that he can begin to sign your books, we'd so appreciate it. I'll hang back here just a little bit if you have any questions to pose, or I'm sure he would accept your questions as you go through the line there. And then I will join you because I'm buying at least two more books. <laughs> Thank you again.